Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mozani, for the kind introductions of the panelists, distinguished panelists. Um, as we uh, you know, listen to the remarks this morning, I think the, the key message was to further uh, deepen regional cooperation, uh, integration, and partnership in order to address this uh, unprecedented multiple crisis uh, stemming from the pandemic uh, COVID-19. So that, that is the, the, a strong message. And also the multi-stakeholder partnership uh, that also uh, critical to, uh, uh, to the regional recovery. So we have the uh, uh, five distinguished uh, speakers uh, this morning. So um, uh, may we start with uh, Dr. Uh, Jay Yang Menon from uh, Singapore. He's a visiting senior fellow from uh, ICS Yusuf Aisha Institute to, to share his perspective on, on, on this kind of resetting and, and rebuilding uh, ASEAN economy in the post pandemic. So uh, we, we will have a, a short introductory remarks about three minutes each. So, uh, and then we will continue with our kind of interactive conversation on the topic. So first, uh, Dr. Uh, Jainan um, Menon, please. Thank you. Thank you, Valerit. Um, it's a great pleasure to be uh, at another uh, KSI event, and I thank the organizers for having me on this ASEAN forum. So um, just in a few minutes that I have, I guess the first point uh, uh, I should make is that I think uh, I agree uh, with uh, Dr. Vanarit that the sessions so far have highlighted the need for uh, regional cooperation uh, in moving forward uh, with recovery. Uh, and building back better. But I also want to argue that we can't wait for regional uh, efforts to kick in right now. And countries have to lead the way with unilateral moves and then build up towards more uh, harmonized regional efforts. So that's uh, uh, an issue I think is critical given the nature of the crisis that we currently face. So um, I think there are three points that I really want to make uh, very quickly. Uh, the first is uh, uh, recovery. And this is, I guess, uh, one of the main themes of this session, which I will focus on. I'm sure others will focus on other aspects. I think recovery is underway in ASEAN, but it's mixed. Um, so we have, I think, uh, for instance, Myanmar, that's going backwards into a deep recession. Uh, we have Singapore that's beating expectations. And then we have all the other ASEAN countries um, that, uh, whose uh, growth rates have been downgraded. Uh, and because of this highly transmissible Delta variant, which is creating the worst outbreaks uh, since the pandemic started in this region. Uh, second, I think we should also look at how we define the pandemic. Uh, and that, I think, is also changing. Um, you know, uh, we have to move from flattening the infection curve, which is where we started, to expanding uh, hospital, the hospital capacity curve, if you like. Uh, and with this shift in um, you know, how we define the pandemic, we should also look at how we focus on long-term impacts and not just short-term fluctuations in growth. Uh, we need to worry now about the fallout, the rise in uh, unemployment, the sharp rise in poverty, and all forms of inequality. We also need to be concerned about the rise in uh, the uh, protectionism sentiment uh, throughout this region and beyond. Uh, you know, this pandemic has not uh, started this uh, concern or anti-globalization push, but it has accelerated it like so many other things. And uh, we need to be wary about this as we start our nascent recoveries in this region. Here in particular, I guess I'm concerned about, you know, all the barriers that have been raised uh, towards uh, capital and labor mobility in the name of the pandemic and health, uh, I'm concerned that they will remain a lot longer after their usefulness has diminished. Um, this is particularly true for, I think, labor restrictions. 
We have seen how um, a lot of migrant workers have been retrenched uh, and sent home and, uh, you know, uh, and they have returned to conditions that are a lot worse that they left uh, initially. And, um, you know, we need to bring down those uh, border barriers uh, very soon. And we should start planning to do so uh, very quickly. Um, and uh, in relation to this, I think what we have heard so far from the Minister from Tourism is very pertinent, as well as um, what uh, uh, Minister Sorosak uh, from Cambodia, the Minister of Commerce, has re uh, reiterated. I think uh, tourism, opening up to tourism is critical going forward. I think uh, Delta has uh, shown us how border measures are becoming less and less useful in containing the pandemic. Uh, if you look at um, across ASEAN, um, the number of imported cases as a share of domestic community transmission is now falling sharply. In Singapore, for instance, imported cases were about 10 uh, compared to about one or two before Delta. Now it's still 10, but the domestic transmission or community transmission is uh, in the thousands, right? So you cannot stop Delta by keeping your borders closed. You have to improve your domestic surveillance. Uh, but here, I think uh, the differences across countries have as much to do with how we test and report uh, the rates as they do with anything else. Uh, so uh, again, I want to reiterate that um, we need to consider uh, the focus shift from uh, just infection rates uh, to uh, hospitalization rates and mortality rates, uh, especially as the vaccination rates ramp up. So uh, to conclude, the three points I hope you can take away uh, uh, from my short uh, presentation is that uh, because the pandemic is peaking in this region, uh, we uh, are concerned about recovery, but recovery will not be derailed. It will be dampened mostly, but there are a lot of differences across countries. And actually these differences are, uh, are important, but often they reflect more about, um, uh, you know, things like uh, how we test and how we report infection rates. And also I think the differences are greater for the long-term effects and the short-term effects. Growth is returning in most countries, but uh, in the poorer countries, uh, a decade or more of gains from poverty reduction has been reversed. And uh, we have to deal with this in a post-pandemic new normal. The best way to deal with that and to make recovery sustainable is to start opening borders as we increase our vaccination rates. Um, we have to start planning right now um, for a very uh, uh, quick opening of borders as vaccination rates catch up. In fact, as I said, Delta has made it even more urgent. We cannot keep uh, uh, the pandemic under control with border measures anymore. Delta is too transmissible to be able to do that. What we have to do is deal with it domestically and uh, that's where the focus should lie. So uh, with that, uh, let me thank you for your attention and I look forward to the other panelists and to the Q&A later on. Thank you and back to you, Manolet. Thank you, Dr. J. Nang Menon. Very interesting kind of insight with regard to reopening strategy. We need to take action now, right? Uh, next, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Chris uh, Hira Bayashi from the ASEAN Japan Center from Tokyo, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Banaris. And I'm very honored to be part, be part of this important symposium. And uh, as we, we are very happy to do so. And we, the ASEAN Japan Center, has a 40 year history in serving as a bridge between ASEAN member states and Japan to promote trade, investment, and tourism, more importantly, people to people exchange. So from our point of view, how ASEAN as a region being able to build back better and recover as well as prevent and mitigate future pandemic 
we need to consider at least three plus one area of strategic policy choice under their implementations immediately, as Dr. Jayanta mentioned. Uh, those three plus one, including health policy for regional health security, and education policy for human security, and economic policy for regional economic security, and accelerating action to address climate change and environmental de de degradation. I try to be briefly touch upon each three plus one. Uh, firstly, building resilient, sustainable health policy choice, which should include how to strengthen and reform resilient primary health care for all as a critical safeguarding system to prevent and mitigate future and the current pandemic at the front line. And how to manage current pandemic through either achieving and maintaining high vaccination coverage or focusing or focusing on protecting high risk group and only controlling cases. We are aware that region has faced difficulty to timely and effectively de deploy vaccines and which have partially lead the current prolonged COVID-19 surge in this region. So regional vaccine security initiative should be also be much prioritized in this policy choices. Secondly, about the economic security, we see the importance of building resilient, economically inclusive, financial, macroeconomic, fiscal, monetary, and trade policy. We know that COVID-19 disproportionately impact women, small, medium-sized business. Therefore, policy choice should be made and implemented with careful attention paid to women, small and medium-sized business and young people. And thirdly, resilient, inclusive, and education policy. In 2020 alone, across East Asia and Pacific, including ASEAN countries, school closure due to government stringent policy on education have affected over 325 million children, while remote class have been provided at least 80 million what 20% of children have no, not been able to access digital and broadcast remote learning during COVID-19. This economy, educational loss is huge. If children are faced with another year of school closure, like in 2022, the effect will be referred to gener generation to generation and generation to come. And it will be very difficult to build back better for our children. And the last but not least, and plus one is about accelerating action toward climate change and environment degradation. With regard to the pandemic, we have at least effective vaccine. But for climate change, we do not have such vaccine yet, but only commitment and the determination to take immediate actions. And all three plus one are influence each other and therefore should be closely interlinked. And with regard to opportunity, pre-COVID-19 era, ASEAN significantly advanced in digital technology, as well as strengthening digital integration, embracing multilateralism and the multi-stakeholder partnership, as His Excellency Sorasak mentioned today. And also so many countries have a favorite demographics, so-called population dividend and rising urbanization with emergence of a new class of aspirational customer who demand of quality, healthy, and sustainable and living condition. Therefore, digital transformation across the system at all age and the genders, in government system, business practice, health and education at all level is very important. And also advancing green and smart city initiative and increasing multilateral strategic partnership for open, inclusive, and peaceful region are all very promising opportunity for the region. I hope our center can contribute to your effort, and we promise we are and will be always with you. Thank you very much, Chair, and over to you. Thank you, uh, Hira Payasisan, for very comprehensive remarks, and very interesting that you mentioned there's no vaccine for climate change. <laughs> A very strong statement on that, and uh, really grateful for, for your emphasis on inclusive and sustainable recovery. 
uh, moving forward. Uh, next, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Dino uh, Pati Dajal, founder and chairman of Foreign Policy Committee of Indonesia, and also former uh, Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia. Please, uh, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chang, and I want to say hello to uh, the other panelists. Uh, and I'm speaking also as a uh, COVID survivor. Um, uh, four out of my four out of five in my family had COVID, including my parents. But Alhamdulillah, we all survived. So, uh, uh, so it's good to be here. A couple of points I want to make. One is, look, uh, how do we uh, rebuild uh, or build back better? I think uh, the, uh, the our ASEAN's ability to uh, achieve uh, a, a green transition uh, would be would be important. Yeah. Uh, so Indonesia, for example, since uh, COVID, uh, there's been a great deal of funds allocated by the government to uh, uh, provide stimulus uh, to the economy, just like any other ASEAN economy. Uh, but somehow the the amount allocated for green investments, you know, green infrastructure, um, are very minimal. I mean, uh, compared to uh, European Union, which allocates about thirty seven percent of their stimulus to uh, green investments uh, uh, in Indonesia, I think in much of Southeast Asia, it's still pretty low. and And this is a, a missed opportunity because, you know, this is the time when the government is uh, rethinking about its development priorities, development strategies, and this is time when climate change is, is the top of the agenda, uh, especially uh, in the run up to COP26 this year. So uh, I hope uh, we're not missing this opportunity to uh, pursue a green transition uh, because uh, the science says that uh, we really have uh, the next 10 years um, to ensure uh, ambitious cuts that would lead to a net zero world by uh, 2050 and thereby assuring climate change uh, below the threshold of 1.5 degrees Celsius or uh, at the most uh, two degrees Celsius. But ASEAN needs to be part of this uh, global efforts to decarbonize the economy. And one of the best ways is, is to turn uh, our development strategy uh, and achieve uh, green, low carbon uh, development path. So, so that's one. Uh, secondly, uh, I think uh, for all of ASEAN, it's quite clear now health, health security is going to be front and center of everything, right? Uh, you know, we've always thought, hey, you know, what if a virus would come in, you know, and just disrupt everything, right? And every, you know, even the Defense Department had uh, these thoughts uh, in their white paper. Uh, I'm talking about Indonesia, yeah. but uh, no one really thought thought it through and planned for it and prepared for it, right? Uh, and guess what? When the pandemic, when the virus came, uh, all of us panicked, and no one had a playbook, right? And as a result, uh, you know, we see all the uh, uh, damages that has been going on. So uh, I think the biggest lesson is that uh, health security is really at the top of the uh, national security consideration uh, from now on. And uh, this health security uh, uh, affects uh, everybody, um, unlike other terrorism, uh, other challenges of security like terrorism, uh, uh, which affects only a, a small part of the population but health security really uh, affects uh, everyone and everyone in the region. So it is definitely an ASEAN problem. Uh, and somehow, again, I can be wrong on this, uh, but somehow I noticed uh, ASEAN cooperation on health security is, is not optimal yet, right? Uh, it's sort of a feeling that every country on its own, everyone's closing their own borders, uh, very small uh, measure of cooperation here. Yeah. I'm talking about substantive uh, cooperation. Right? Uh, a lot of diplomatic meetings, rhetorics, uh, political uh, speeches, and so on. But if you really look at what ASEAN countries are working together substantively with one another, uh, you see uh, you know, it could be a lot uh, better. And in fact, ASEAN countries are working 
closely with extra regional countries, yeah, individually rather than among one another. So I, I think that cause for for reflection. Uh, another thing, uh, I know I have only three minutes, but but digital is king now, right? Uh, digital uh, connections, digital education, uh, digital uh, you know, socialization, uh, digital business. You know, everything is uh, digital now, uh, and. Uh, I think uh, has uh, brought a lot of good opportunities. Uh, like for, for my organization, for example, we reached a lot more people uh, in the last year or so than we ever did in the last four or five years, right? Uh, and I think, uh, yes, digital is not the same as physically meeting one another, but digital uh, does allow you to connect with more people, right? And does allow you to have more meetings and more interactions Right, because you don't have to go anywhere, right? And you can have four or five uh, digital meetings uh, uh, every day, right? But uh, uh, also expose the digital divide uh, because uh, in education, you know, the rich kids with the Wi-Fi at home, you know, they can afford to have, uh, uh, you know, uh, online education all the time. Uh, but most of the students in Indonesia, in the Philippines, uh, would imagine in Thailand, in Myanmar, Vietnam, and so on, uh, most of them or many of them don't have uh, digital access. And that, this creates a really serious uh, educational challenge. Uh, the Indonesian government has allowed uh, uh, free uh, uh, pulse, yeah, uh, pulse uh, to buy uh, 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 for students to get free Wi Fi, right? But even that is problematic yeah, because uh, the access is not the same uh, and, and the limit is too low and, and so on and so on. But digital is king. <laughs> now uh, there's a tremendous digital opportunity and I think uh, ASEAN should really enhance its digital uh, cooperation uh, to uh, you know, address uh, all these challenges and, and maximize on the opportunities. Uh, I'll stop there and then we can have more later on. Thank, thank you, uh, Pak Dino. Uh, with regards to the opportunity for change and reform, I think you stressed the green transition is part of the opportunity. Uh, during the pandemic, post pandemic, and I think all the, the, the three panelists stressed the importance of public health security. This is kind of the to, to reopen the economy and society. I think uh, this is the, the, the way forward to invest more resources in public health, uh, infrastructure, and capacity. Uh, next, I would like to invite uh, 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 Professor uh, Sutipan uh, from Chulalongkorn University uh, of Thailand. Please. Thank you, Chair, Dr. Wanarit. Uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Good morning, all participants. Um, uh, let me also join the uh, three uh, speakers uh, from ASEAN, you know, to thank the organizer for the kind opportunity given to us uh, uh, of a very active uh, ASEAN leadership uh, and partnership forum. I remember, of course, the physical presence we had in Vientiane. When I look back at my closet the other day and some picture we had. Okay, uh, now, of course, uh, this year uh, and, and still, as you know, we uh, still at the almost the second year of pandemic, uh, which has become known. Uh, like when it started last year, you remember the kind of uh, lockdown, real shock to us. Of course, there is still somewhere here uh, around, you know, with this idea uh, very much uh, about the uh, Delta variant, which is uh, less longer than the kind of uh, the first or second round, whatever rounds uh, we had in our region. But I think it's, uh, you know, there's no country and no part in this globalized world is safe, uh, you could say, you know, from pandemic. So that's why I think it's so important, again, to remind us about the kind of, uh, you know, the pandemic has really shown us a kind of diversity, shock and impact uh, also to us, uh, you know, never seen, uh, of course, in our uh, living memory. So, uh, and it go beyond the health crisis, of course, uh, I would say kind of uh, multiple disruption, multiple transformation we go through 
uh, and uh, to cover very much of course very aspect of our life and uh, livelihood and even the whole society. So ASEAN, I would say again, ASEAN is so open. Uh, no doubt about that, that we continue to open to each other and to the world. So we learn very much as well. And uh, of course, it's a hard experience to go through all this. Uh, although in uh, we're facing in various degrees, you know, that's, uh, uh, you know, if you're taking the people at the center, of course, uh, uh, people have to start to adapt first uh, to how they have to live with it. You know, people at work, you know, uh, hybrid work now become the, the standard and, and also the way educated our children, you know, and even also the kind of the uh, unemployment increase, of course, has a kind of the reduction of economic activity from the uh, kind of the lockdown. All these cause quite, of course, uh, adaptation to uh, our society and our economy. I would like to bring uh, 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 three issues to the table to complement what our three colleagues of earlier have been said. I think it's um, you know the very important to remind and and also I wonder the world will ever be uh, looking the same again as uh, pre-COVID. You know uh, uh, what I mean that uh, we have much have been said about new normal, uh, you know next normal. So we, I think we need to also interpret in our recovery and. More importantly, uh, the word is rebuilding, is it uh, right we catch, uh, as Samori said, we need to rebuilding uh, long-term recovery. Probably we recover in the next uh, two, three years, but rebuilding is a more a long-term perspective. And that's why uh, I think uh, this pandemic might cause us to think the world may not be able to same again. I would like to, uh, you know, that uh, because of the, the transformation uh, that been forced, uh, you know, like the meeting of us today, or the travel, we cannot, uh, I, I could say from these uh, two examples, you know, uh, concretely, uh, you use these two opposite, uh, uh, you know, the example. Uh, travel, uh, for example, we uh, disrupt completely from plane to, of course, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, the physical prison, we're talking about very much ASEAN intra, ASEAN uh, people movement and extra movement. Thailand alone, you know, but travel, 40 million, if you think about it, uh, 2019. Now this year, we reduced to less than 100,000, you know, 400 times less before COVID. Of course, if you recover back, but you think about the, uh, uh, the kind of uh, uh, macro impact, 12% uh, of the GDP gone because Thailand based very much on tourism. I mean, imagine I will share one of it, you know, Cambodia, our friend in Vietnam, you know, Indonesia, uh, you know, Malaysia and all this. We, we depend very much on travel because we are open, our ASEAN. So that is something gone and I had to rebuild. And in between, you can imagine the travel industry, you know, how to recover uh, safe travel. I agree very much uh, with Jay, you know, uh, 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 of course, uh, focusing on uh, the kind of, uh, at the national level is important. Everybody do that homework, but we need to come back also to the regional uh, uh, cohesion, how we would like to do this. So that's why I think is, uh, on the other hand, the other example is also clear. You know, the, uh, I think uh, Pat Dino already mentioned about the digital and uh, that's why no, once no travel is uh, uh, we, we need to depend on, on this. And luckily we still have this, you know, this uh, landscape of uh, connectivity uh, digital connectivity, digital transformation, we're talking before 4.0, but this time it become real. It's a false transformation for us. It's a kind of maybe unintended transformation, but you can see uh, uh, when we stay home, 
you know, that, that we need to also, you know, that uh, work from home, uh, maybe also order food, uh, you know, just we have the uh, new startup in ASEAN, uh, Grab and many is Indonesia, you have the Wikipedia. Uh, we had uh, to order things, uh, e-commerce been struggling uh, very strongly. You know, this is the, the other side of the coin, you know, that's uh, been uh, 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 last year 62 billion e-commerce, this year it's 100 billion estimated. In the next five years, we go to something like 500 billion US dollars, so, you know, increased by so many times. This is a forced transformation by COVID. Without COVID, it might become slower, you know. So that kind of thing is important. It's go for also in education, it's go for uh, uh, hybrid work, as I said. And this is something uh, we talked uh, before and ASEAN has planned, but this plan has to advance even further, how to skill our people. This is part of rebuilding and we still need perhaps to revise on that. That's why I come to the second point about the, uh, you know, that's, uh, we've been talking about the ASEAN development, uh, the way we integrate with each other and uh, how we will build on uh, our future integration um, and operate it. Uh, you know, that with a good concept, being open, inclusive, sustainable, people-oriented, we have all that kind of notion. But uh, uh, whatever rebuilding is mean here uh, for post-pandemic, I think is also imply that ASEAN need to work together. One of course, we clean uh, our tasks at home. You know, each of us had to clear back the COVID at home, the health and all kinds of things at home. So ASEAN policy maker had to be more visible, had to be more coherent. I think uh, coherent policy on like uh, Jay mentioned about the health and travel. This is something of we need to coordinate to make ASEAN come back again, how we would like to free our border. You know, we have to live with it with COVID and that's one thing that we have to do it. The next big thing is also maybe ASEAN uh, vision 2025, uh, you know, need to be revised uh, pre COVID, uh, the COVID not there, not there now, is strongly uh, a one element about the health and well being of the people uh, the uh, so-called ASEAN point zero already mentioned, but now you go deeper, you go much uh, stronger. And uh, also uh, we need to look at the, also the uh, global environment that, you know, I am uh, very much agreed on this SDG, uh, COP26 coming around the corner. So uh, environment and SDG is something uh, we have the target uh, but this COVID also impact that kind of thing. And uh, last but not least, I would like to move on to the, the issue of the kind of the geopolitics of our region, which might impact also our rebuilding. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we will not have much time if we can come back to the discussion, you know, that's uh, US-China uh, rivalry and competition that caused you know, uh, our region, uh, uneasy, of course, it's already uh, happens uh, very much uh, from China, BRI, uh, from Indo-Pacific, the New Orcas, the kind of RCEP we have with uh, the region and the kind of CTTPP, whatever the new infrastructure, and all this, you know, that might cause our production and trade, which is a core of our as integration impact. So they did something that uh, we need to, we don't want to choose side, of course, if it is come to, uh, you know, the tech war, for example, 5G, 6G, whatever, you know, between the Western technology or Chinese technology or whatever, you know, this kind of thing uh, will very much uh, be part of the kind of changing landscape for post-pandemic ASEAN. And also lastly, uh, as already mentioned by uh, other colleagues, you know, the, uh, we cannot forget uh, our Myanmar friend. You know, the Myanmar is real uh, trouble in real crisis. 
and it's a triple crisis now, you know, that's uh, since a military coup uh, took uh, power in February this year. And uh, 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 meanwhile, they struggle with the pandemic, uh, you know, which caused quite, uh, uh, you know, the hardship for the people. The ADB already forecast this year, you know, with a kind of a crisis uh, from the, uh, the, 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 the political crisis, uh, the pandemic crisis, and an economic crisis that caused GDP to contract by 18.4%. You know, is this unimaginable if you live in a country, you know, that the GDP contract? And this is our neighbor, ASEAN, and Thailand has a long border, you know, 2,401 kilometers. And you can imagine we already have. Uh, few millions in our country and also Malaysia or, you know, that's uh, that part of the scenario of uh, migrant uh, uh, workers uh, happen in ASEAN and from Myanmar. So we have to treat all that. And uh, that's something that uh, I think is a humanitarian corridor need to open and I hope the ASEAN boy will move in a more positive uh, uh, and and uh, uh, way and, and strength. I better stop here. Thank you, uh, Chair. Thanks, thank you, uh, Professor Sutipan. Um, I think only nine years uh, away that we need to achieve uh, sustainable development goals. So I think perhaps we need to review uh, ASEAN's uh, kind of uh, uh, roadmap toward the uh, SDG in the next five years. Uh, next, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Sutipan now, uh, which is one of the key drivers or leaders of our ASEAN Chairmanship Cambodia next year. Uh, listening to all these comments and inputs, Excellency Dr. Suksipana, can you highlight some of the key kind of priorities Cambodia Chairmanship next year and how to achieve these uh, priorities and how to connect also the dots, the, the suggestion that proposed by our four panelists uh, uh, today? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Van Rutt, uh, for giving me the floor. Uh, I just want to say hi to, to Jay. It's been a long time I haven't seen him. Uh, it, it, it's so good to, to see you, Jay. And uh, I want to tell you I'm in Singapore, so uh, we, we should find time to have a, a coffee when my Trace Together app is uh, updated. Yeah. But uh, I, it, it's quite interesting to, to listen to all the previous speakers. Uh, and one thing that is clear is that um, the, the COVID pandemic is really changing the dynamics uh, of, uh, I, I would say, you, you know, previous speaker mentioned a lot about health, about people, about, you know, uh, the SME, that sort of thing. But from my perspective, from Cambodia perspective, uh, what it really have changed is the dynamics of uh, uh, the, the geopolitical of the, 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 the player in the political uh, sphere. And, and for that, uh, for example, Cambodia was uh, uh, prepared to be the host of the ASEM uh, Summit 13, uh, which was planned last year. Um, but again, because of COVID, we had to push for another six months in the hope that we can do it uh, physical. Then we have to push again because uh, the, the, the Delta variant, right? So ultimately we have to settle uh, for this November and no choice. Uh, we have to do uh, virtually, but again, a virtual summit is not a summit. Let's be real about that. A virtual summit is not a summit. It's people speaking uh, like we are doing now, you know, uh, uh, in the comfort of our home, of our apartment, you know, uh, but the dynamics of uh, the, the summit is not there, you know, because the summit is basically uh, a physical summit anyway, will enable leader, you know, two, three leader to pull each other aside, uh, to whisper, to lobby, to, uh, push their initiative uh, to find some solution, to look for answer in some uh, difficult question that they could not speak on uh, 
uh, you know, on a microphone, that sort of thing. But uh, a virtual summit is, it, I would say, it defeat the whole purpose of the summit. But again, uh, perhaps that will be the new normal, the, the, the post-COVID uh, normal that we have to do a lot of this uh, event online. But I would say the effect is not there. You know, Cambodia have uh, spent, I don't know how many millions of dollars to, you know, get ready for the summit. It's 51 uh, country uh, leader uh, with the European Union, with ASEAN. So we spend enormous amount of money to buy fleets of car to build a new conference center to charter flight and everything uh, and then you know boom gone so anyway uh, we 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 still push forward uh, to have substantive discussion uh, for for for, uh, for for the asm summit of course uh, the the core of our you know uh, agenda is uh, how to uh, reinforce how to strengthen how to uh, boost multilateralism uh, for shared growth so that we 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 can uh, uh, I, I would say uh, let's face it when we when we have the the theme it was during the president trump presidency so it, it's it's then you know president biden came so but again uh, multilateralism is still there because uh, let's face it with with the us uh, coming back uh, it does not mean that they are uh, uh, pro uh, multilateralism. It, it still have to be, uh, you know, we still have to find out later on how uh, the U.S. will see the trade aspect of it. You know, uh, uh, the CPTPP, for example, will the, they they will rejoin? Uh, of course, China have made an application to join the CPTPP. So it's a lot of uncertainty, you know, uh, moving forward. But one thing is clear that uh, in, in this ASM uh, summit, we are stressing heavily on uh, multilateral aspect, you know, the reform of the UN, you know, the, the reform of the WTO, uh, the, the COP26 uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, next months. So uh, a lot of this discussion are popping up, uh, you know, and we all try to find some, uh, some, some, some sort of like, uh, uh, feasible uh, solution uh, to to the this global issue but for sure you know it's a uh, it's it's not an easy process to negotiate tax online you know uh, everybody have their view but then uh, you you cannot pull people aside for coffee but that that's basically how how i see uh, the the big impact of covid you know, in terms of uh, changing the dynamics of geopolitical negotiation, that sort of thing. You know, uh, uh, a, a, a virtual negotiation is not a negotiation. It's more like two people talking uh, to each other on, on, uh, on the screen of a computer, yeah. Um, for, for next year, Van Red, uh, we, we, we've been uh, preparing uh, to take over the ASEAN chairmanship from uh, Brunei. And of course, you know, like any, uh, ASEAN chairmanship, you know, it's it's all about, you know, uh, the continuous, continuously building up on what our fellow uh, previous chair have built. So for Cambodia, it's uh, a, we're no different. We we are, you know, taking on, uh, you know, and building on the work of a previous chair of Brunei, of Singapore, of Thailand, uh, in the hope that we we can. Uh, Solidify certain areas that are that we think are, are concrete, you know, that we think are you know tangible. Of course, bearing in mind the COVID dimension, uh, which is clearly one of the uh, you know top agenda you know of uh, the, the post COVID recovery, you know, and and you have issue that is very COVID specific, like uh, the the recovery plan how to deal uh, with the, a, the return of migrants so that they can have a better, you know, uh, uh, life, you know, that sort of thing. Um, vaccine uh, multilateralism, that, that's very important. Um, but one thing that uh, Cambodia will be very pleased to, to, to reconvene, uh, and it's something that we have uh, initiated um, 10 years ago when we have uh, the chair, and this one, uh, you know, I have to uh, say, uh, I have to give credit to, uh, you know, uh, Cesar. Uh, and in this case here, uh, 
is the late Surin Pitsavan uh, that I, I recall. You know, uh, at that time, 12 years ago, we, he, we chat and he have an idea. He says, ah, you know, um, I could not do this uh, so-called ASEAN global dialogue because at that time in Thailand, it, there was a big, uh, so sort of like a red shirt, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and then they all the leader have to run away. There's a, all this uh, physical commotion. So so he couldn't do it. So he say, you know, during Cambodian chair, uh, Cambodia should take on this uh, this uh, initiative and uh, convene the head of the multilateral, you know, uh, financial institution and have a dialogue on on issue that pertain uh, to to our region. So we we have this ASEAN global dialogue. At that time, we invite. Uh, the, the World Bank, the IMF, uh, ADB, uh, UNCTA, WTO, the UN. So it, it's quite a, 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 a big event. And this year, I mean, next year again, we will reconvene the, the second uh, round of uh, the ASEAN Global Dialogue. Of course, we will expand uh, the, the participation to include uh, other UN agency that are uh, that have uh, concrete uh, impact on say for example SME uh, on uh, WHO for example but it will be an interesting dialogue that we we hope to uh, harness the the resource uh, the the knowledge the uh, capacity of uh, this international and world institution to 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 come up with uh, what they think their agency could be able to contribute to the rebuilding of uh, of our region so I'm, I'm quite excited about that. And it's one of my, uh, my uh, sort of like uh, my baby, you know, and uh, it, it's quite a challenging thing to convene. But I hope that uh, the ASEAN Global Dialogue, uh, which will be uh, done toward the end of the year, you know, uh, uh, on the margin of the ASEAN Summit and related summit that it will, it will be done uh, in physical. So, so that we, we can have the real uh, uh, physical contact uh, and exchange, yeah. So basically that, that's what I, I had in mind, uh, Mandarit, and then we can uh, always uh, go to some uh, question and answer later on, yeah. Thank you very much, yeah. Thank you, uh, Excellency Dr. Soksipana. I, I think it's a very critical platform, the ASEAN Global Dialogue, uh, and uh, we are looking forward to uh, seeing the revival of the ASEAN Global Dialogue by bringing all international actors to, to the ASEAN Forum, related uh, forum. Um, we, we have covered a number of uh, kind of policies that suggestions and inputs on how we can reset and uh, rebuild ASEAN in uh, more inclusive and uh, sustainable ways. And I think what, what we haven't touched much on at this stage is uh, resilience, the concept of a, a resilient ASEAN. Um, a lot of uh, analysts and experts uh, argue that the world is not ready to uh, deal with another pandemic. It, so it seems that our learning curve is a bit slow over the past, let's say, two years. So, uh, so in our region, ASEAN, are we ready for another pandemic? Uh, if not, why? Uh, I would like to, to uh, invite Dr. Apakdino first because he experienced the most, I think, uh, because he's a, as he mentioned, he's the COVID-19 survivor. So uh, are we ready for another wave of pandemic or new type of pandemic? Thank you. Well, I think, I think we are ready here. Right. Uh, I don't know if we're fully ready, but we are readier before, than before. I think. Look for 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 me. I'm now very skeptical when I hear of countries that are doing so well, right? Because you know they said that about India at one point, and then guess what happened, right? And they said that about Indonesia, uh, and guess what happened, uh, and and so on, right? So uh, I think. Uh, no country should be uh, overconfident and preventive measures is always the best. Uh, I, I tell you why, Indonesia twice, uh, we lost out on preventive measures. First, uh, when the first wave came, before that we were so confident and we said, uh, no, COVID's not gonna hit us. And guess what? It hit us very badly. 
And then, uh, you know, the number starts uh, under control. And then we saw what happened in India with the Delta. And uh, we didn't do enough to uh, prepare ourselves for the arrival of uh, Delta uh, in Indonesia. As a result, uh, you know, we have over at one point hundred thousand daily cases, right? Which is which is one of the world's epicentrum, um, and and you know it was pretty bad at, at some point. Everyone I knew had uh, COVID uh, virus, right? Uh, so so twice uh, we knew we saw it coming, but we didn't prepare enough, right? So uh, I think that is a big lesson for all of uh, ASEAN uh, that um, uh, you, you know uh, prevention and preparing is always better than uh, uh, responding to it. And and the other question, Dr. Chang, uh, is this, uh, and it's more a question also. You know, COVID has made me and my family a lot closer because you know we stay home uh, right for six weeks uh, together. We don't go anywhere. And it's made the country also a lot closer because people are having a sense of solidarity uh, in, in fighting COVID. Yeah. Is ASEAN getting closer because of COVID-19, right? Uh, you know, I think that's an interesting question. I don't, I, you know, I don't have the answer to that. Uh, you know, I appreciate when the ASEAN Secretary General uh, sent $1 million of humanitarian assistance to Myanmar, uh, one of the hardest cases, uh, hardest hit cases in ASEAN and so on. Uh, you know, so these gestures are very important, right? Uh, but but is it important? You know, interesting question: Is ASEAN becoming closer, right? Uh, since COVID, uh, just as families have become closer and whole nations, uh, individual members of ASEAN have become closer. A very very uh, interesting question: Is ASEAN getting closer? And uh, Pak Dino is a long time observable ASEAN and doesn't have answer. So <laughs> very interesting. Uh, so that, that remain a question mark, I think for many of us, uh, we need to observe uh, action on the ground, uh, their behavior on the ground rather than statement and words. And, you know, uh, also relating to uh, uh, building a resilient ASEAN, uh, Dr. Che Yan mentioned uh, about, uh, we need to move from flattening the curve uh, flattening the curve to uh, expanding uh, health or hospital capacity, right? So that is part of the resilience uh, uh, by expanding the kind of uh, the healthcare uh, capacity. So can you elaborate a bit more on, on this uh, healthcare uh, expansion? Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Manarit. I think, um, uh, yeah, one of the problems with... Um, the healthcare system in many countries, um, in ASEAN and elsewhere, is that uh, they are run a lot like airlines are run, right? So airlines uh, want to run at full capacity as often as possible. Uh, you know, having empty seats on an airline is not a good idea. And so hospitals, when they are privatized especially, don't want uh, spare capacity right? Uh, empty hospital beds are a huge cost. And that's not the way we need to uh, run hospitals, right? Uh, we, there, there is a public function. We need to have spare capacity available for times of uh, crises or peaks in infections during crises. And I think that's where the only way to do that is to have, you know, um, public involvement or at least private public involvement or re better regulation. So we need spare capacity to be available, uh, not just hospital beds, but ICU uh, capacity as well, uh, so that uh, you know, the worst effects of this pandemic are not realized. Uh, you know, the worst, of course, is when people die, but also when people you know, end up uh, having to require oxygen uh, to survive. Uh, you know, these are the sorts of things we need to overcome. But I guess more broadly, uh, you know, uh, we know that the SDGs, as was mentioned, uh, was we were missing our targets with the broad range of SDGs even before the pandemic started. And because of that, the effects of the pandemic were a lot worse uh, because we weren't up to speed with the SDGs before the pandemic. Um, now, but this is a vicious circle, right? So uh, the worst, uh, 
the worsened effects of the pandemic have resulted in a further slowing in reaching the SDGs. So this goes in a vicious circle that we need to break. Um, and um, that's where I think uh, we need to focus if we are going to build resilience uh, for the next pandemic, and in fact, overcoming the current one, which is, you know, as you know, far from over, it seems, uh, uh, especially in this region. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Uh, also relating to this um, kind of resilient question, um, uh, in addition to public health sector, we also have social infrastructure and economic infrastructure. Uh, and uh, Dr. Uh, Chris uh, Hirayabashi uh, uh, mentioned about uh, this kind of inclusive social economic development. And uh, you also mentioned that inequality have been exacerbated uh, by the pandemic. And in order to build more resilient society and economy, you propose two, uh, women empowerment and SMEs capacity building. Uh, we would like to seek your opinion on the role of Japan, which is one of the key dialogue partners of ASEAN. Uh, down the road, look to the future. Uh, what Japan should do more to uh, support ASEAN to build a more resilient society and, and economy. And Japan has introduced Society 5.0. Anything that we can learn from uh, Society 5.0 that Japan has introduced? Uh, Dr. Uh, Chris? Thank you very much. I'm not on behalf of government, but uh, of course, at a part of Japanese society, I really want, uh, hope Japan can contribute this resilient effort. Particularly, maybe Japan's value is more empathy or, or solidarity oriented society. I said this kind of not like a defeating each other, more a sense of people centered, not uh, efficiency focus, more empathy, solidarity focus. I think this can be much more built resilient society, social infrastructure, even including health uh, and uh, uh, economic society. And uh, we learned the COVID-19 almost targeted leaving uh, vulnerable people behind. So bas basically how we can protect those vulnerable people, including aged population with single family, and also women, uh, particularly for vulnerable and the young children in living poor condition, and also people with disability, those are inclusive, can make a more bigger changes, more bigger dynamics, and uh, digital transformation help a lot to address and reach in those vulnerable population. I think Japan also needs to do so, but we can learn each other and the back to back kind of partnership. And uh, for instance, women has a very busy in caring their family and also their business. And also a huge uh, uh, capacity gap in e-commerce or whatever. But the current digital uh, transformation introduced by COVID-19 that, that women can have a more chance to participate e-commerce because all financial technology fintech is covered by e-commerce e uh, itself. So those kind of digital transformation, not just the targeted business process, but the more inclusively for women, young people, even the aged group who are not able to access to internet other services. So the key word I think is, is not cost efficiency, more emphasis and solidarity. Over to Chair. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, so I, I think a digit, inclusive digital economy uh, perhaps is the, something that we need to elaborate more uh, with regard to the economic resilience uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, next, uh, 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 Professor uh, Sutipan, um, you know, in addition to what you you uh, you presented us uh, in your short remarks, uh, you you did not. Uh, we would like to know more about the political resilience uh, because. Uh, across Southeast Asia, we're facing a certain degree of political upheavals, right? And you mentioned Myanmar, and of course, Thailand also facing critical domestic politics there. And Dr. Sukti uh, uh, alluded to a bit on 2011 uh, when Thailand was a chair <laughs> or ASEAN at the time, and uh, the political dynamics, changing political dynamics affects the uh, uh, ASEAN dynamics. So uh, when it comes to political resilience, uh, do you think that we are uh, able to uh, respond to the political crisis and upheavals 
uh, looking at the case in Thailand and, and what is your outlook on the Myanmar, Myanmar political upheaval now? Uh, thank you, uh, Chair, for, for raising this issue. I think is uh, when you're talking about the uh, uh, political resilience, uh, uh, what makes me think is about the kind of uh, future ASEAN, you know, that's, uh, whether it's democratic or non democratic or not, but it needs to be uh, based and driven by, uh, you know, that social economic and cultural conditions uh, that we have. And uh, that's quite important, you know, our people, our institution, how we allow, you know, the, uh, the, the, whether it's democratic or democratic value, you know, to perform, you know, they need to have their rights and, 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 and their talk, you know. So that's, that's quite important. And it seems to be, of course, uh, uh, that, uh, as you said, just, uh, Treated in part uh, by by uh, in big part in some country, of course, depend you know by the pandemic, you know, because like uh, here in Thailand too, the 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 government just say okay, you have the curfew, you stay home, you know, and and that kind of thing. So uh, people cannot. Uh, I think it's happened during the, the the hard lockdown. So that's something that's uh, go against, of course. We say he's not only in our region, but I think in uh, Western country, uh, I don't know, Japan, uh, Dr. Chris already mentioned. So all this uh, perhaps uh, it's took quite a while, you know, because uh, by the, what do you call expression of COVID and, and, and that's why the, as, as uh, what do you call the, uh, as uh, uh, the way to, to say many, many governments say, well, because of COVID, you need to, we need to do this and that. We cannot uh, tweet uh, the kind of the, uh, uh, political expression we like to do. Uh, so that's that's something I think has already been quite uh, over a year. And I hope uh, I, 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 the trend should be better. I, I, I see, except of course, in Myanmar is a case of exception. In Thailand, uh, Cambodia, or, or Vietnam, they had a severe lockdown. The same, you know. So I, I imagine uh, mainland ASEAN, you know, which is uh, uh, have a, quite a full blunt during the the, the kind of uh, what do you call the uh, the, uh, the Delta variant. So mainly, uh, you know, the, from the second half of this year, from the around the second quarter, that we all did impact in mainland ASEAN. But of course. Uh, the the uh, uh, maritime ASEAN different, uh, uh, Indonesia, uh, uh, Malaysia, I believe in also the Philippines. But in any way, because he used to be the, the so-called like a best student, right? And last year, you know, COVID uh, control quite, but the severe lockdown and uh, severe control no longer solution. So that's why um, uh, in big part, uh, uh, of course, here, when we, uh, we have the severe lockdown, the, the, the government uh, try to maybe use uh, the so-called, uh, the word of the experts, you know, the medical to, to do this kind of uh, things. Uh, but uh, my, my, uh, my more concern, you know, is uh, this is part of the recovery. And I think is uh, if we be the kind of discussion, whatever in social media, you know, the kind of complaints, and they have to deal in all country about uh, all kind of faction, all kind of left and right opinion. And uh, this is something that uh, in a normal, if you allow, in, uh, they will express now through social media and sometimes to the street, but the street is not uh, what uh, the, the, the government want. But uh, my uh, uh, more concern, political resilience uh, seems to be the, uh, we cannot uh, deny the structural and, and systemic, uh, uh, you know, the uh, changes, uh, and and it seems to be in our in that that, that we not, uh, you know, that, that seem to be that is not matching. I think is there some kind of not matching with uh, uh, a fast changing environment and transformation uh, from COVID, from technology, and all that. You know, we still have very much the, the structural problem. So we still very much systemic problem, the, the kind of inequality, you know, the kind of uh, unemployment created by this COVID. And it will, 
uh, uh, chief quite very strong, I mean, uh, politically. So that's something uh, domestically, uh, many ASEAN countries uh, will face the problem at home. So uh, I think that's, uh, that, that's something that we need to work together. I think is still, you know, among ASEAN, how it could be open and coherent policy, you know, who has a problem, whatever we could discuss as, uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Sok uh, uh, Sipana uh, mentioned very well, it's still important to have our ASEAN to, to be able to, to be uh, look at, at uh, our overall uh, political, uh, you know, resilient as you, you mentioned. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. So I, I yeah, I, I think uh, political resilience is something that we, we have, we need to dive uh, deeper into uh, kind of study and discussion, how to improve our uh, political resilience across Southeast Asia. Uh, Dr. Suksipana, uh, you mentioned about the changing dynamics that affects the ASEAN as an institution. And, and uh, you also uh, a bit uh, still uh, kind of skeptical of the future uh, of the multilateral system and, and this, this kind of, uh, you know, the, the US foreign policy toward multilateralism uh, remain something that we need to, to follow closely. Um, so also related to the question of resilience because you mentioned because of this uh, virtual summit and so on, the disrupted the, the meaning and and the quality of, of, of the multilateral institution. So institutional resilience perhaps is one of the key issue here, uh, institutional resilience. So with regards to ASEAN, how ASEAN can, you know, can innovate its institution uh, in ways that it can deal with either your, your open call rivalries or uh, uh, pandemics and economic crisis or climate crisis. So, you know, come, come back to you with, your, your perspective on how to strengthen a kind of a institutional a resilience of ASEAN in this uh, chaotic uh, world. Well, I, I would say that uh, it's only so much you can do, you can uh, talk, you know, online. And that's why nothing beats a, a physical uh, gathering because, uh, uh, let's face it on the issue of cybersecurity, that sort of thing, right? I mean, no one would want to talk state secret, state, state strategy online, and particularly when, uh, you know, it could be recorded. Uh, so, so these are the, the difficulty of, uh, of uh, negotiating or dealing or, you know, online. So, so I, I think institutional resilience, um, I don't know how we 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 gonna go about uh, sort of like bifurcating uh, this this uh, technology aspect, but again, you, you know, as uh, you, when leader meet, they meet that at that, you know, uh, no assistant is even in the room because there are certain sensitive matter that they want to just mention to their counterpart, and it's only so much you can do when when you're online with uh, with with so many people there. So I, I think this will be the big challenge of uh, Cambodia chairing uh, the ASEAN uh, next year. Well, hopefully, you know, we're only three months away, right? So uh, I, I don't foresee major dramatic uh, uh, change of uh, situation that enable us uh, to, to do uh, sort of like a physical meeting, at least for the first, uh, uh, the first summit you know, of, of the year we will do it, uh, you know, uh, online. But again, we have to wait for uh, improvement of situation to, to change, uh, to do a physical to the end of the year. But, but the challenge uh, next year, for example, when you're talking about geopolitics, how, how do you uh, work on the COC, for example, online? You know, uh, where uh, many things need to be discussed uh, privately, you know, one-to-one, one-to-two, for example, right? Uh, uh, these are the challenge that we 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 have to deal with. Uh, so so I I don't think that uh, you know this COVID thing will it is conducive to push, for example, on on this uh, geopolitical issue on this uh, China U.S. Uh, rivalry that we can find some uh, some some uh, solution. And and of course uh, with this uh, arm racing, 
I, I heard that uh, uh, Republic of Korea is considering, you know, uh, also having a nuclear sub, right? I mean, after, you know, uh, Australia uh, broke the ice and after that, you don't know uh, what's next. So, uh, so I would say Australia really uh, broke the ice to say, look, you know, I'm going to have a nuclear sub and you never know who else uh, would join that, that arms race, right? So, so I think next year will not be an easy chair for Cambodia because you have the other hot potato, which is uh, yeah, Myanmar. Uh, so how, how, how do we deal with, with uh, uh, a brother, you know, a brotherhood in, in Myanmar, which is next door, you know, and we, we cannot afford that thing to uh, yeah, disintegrate it. Uh, and, and I know as a, as a yeah, chair of uh, ASAM Summit, how difficult it is uh, to work on a paragraph on Myanmar, you know, is not easy, not easy. So, so I think next year, you know, it's not a gift. Huh? It's, it's not like Cambodia a chairmanship 2012, you know. Uh, I think 2022 will be a hot potato, uh, seriously, you know, hot potato because of many things. Like, number one, the unconduciveness of uh, doing a thing online, right? That's that's uh, that's always wipe out eighty percent of your productivity, of your efficiency, of your uh, so like uh, so like uh, uh, the the soft power side of it already, right? And then you have a hot issue, geopolitical issue like the AUKUS, uh, you know, uh, Australia, UK, uh, you know. And, and it's quite interesting because, you know, the UK, they, they just uh, get the, this uh, partnership dialogue with ASEAN and then boom, you know, he's supporting uh, the, the nuclear thing in, in Australia. So these are the, the fluidity of the, 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 the regional dynamics, right? It's, it's not, nothing is clear, nothing is certain, uh, nothing is set, you know, uh, and I, I I think uh, you know China and the U.S. is meeting again in Geneva, you know, to to uh, sort things out. But we don't know what's going to be the outcome. Uh, the Iran, you know, nuclear pact, you know, is still uh, in the discussion. Uh, and then you have this whole Afghanistan debacle. Uh, so I think you know we are moving toward uh, next year in a year of uh, turbulence, uh, of a lot of uncertainty. So I'm, I'm not so sure that, uh, you know, we, we can really settle and work on just basic social, economic, uh, migrant work, uh, you know, health issue. These to me, uh, it, it's, uh, it's important, but you have other uh, larger, you know, uh, background, you know, echo that make the life of those who are pushing, particularly the ASEAN social, cultural and an economic pillar, uh, you know, uh, marginalized. When you have the first pillar, the geopolitical thing, uh, taking all the limelight, what do you think is left uh, for the, the, the other two pillars? So, so these to me are some of the issue that I think uh, will be placating uh, our ASEAN chairmanship next year. Thank, thank you very much, Excellency Dr. Sokipana. Yeah, so uh, uh, with uh, Cambodia or the best next year. Um, <laughs> Thank you. We, yeah, we, we, we come to an end uh, our panel discussion. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to, uh, to all the panelists for the excellent uh, insights and inputs. Uh, and I would like to uh, return the floor to our secretariat, uh, Mozani. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, Jay. Thank hey, good to see you, Sivana. Right, we we, we, we got to get together. Huh? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I'll get in touch. Yes. Yeah. Good to see you. Okay. Good to see you. Bye, Bye. 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 B